Thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed the, the break and the wonderful weather we have uh, today in Valencia and in this uh, fantastic cloister. And we're going to continue, and I'm switching now to English, so apologies uh, to everyone, mainly because we have uh, the privilege of having with us uh, Osger Honor, who's going to be talking about disentangling the support for populism, Brexit, and beyond. Let me just introduce Osger. Osger Honor is an associate professor in spatial economics and real estate at the University of Cambridge. And she is also a fellow in economics and land economy and director of studies at Sydney Sussex College and is affiliated to the Research Institute of Industrial Economics, although I think now it has changed to retail economics in, uh, in a certain way, in Stockholm in Sweden. She's got a, a long trajectory of uh, work and research in, in Sweden where, despite the fact that she's Turkish, where she spent most of her adult uh, life. Her research mainly deals with issues related to urban amenities, to migration, to labor mobility, to microgeography of segregation and ethnic enclaves. And she was, in 2019, the recipient of the Young Researcher Award in Sweden. Uh, and she also writes uh, monthly columns at uh, the, one of the main newspapers in Sweden, which is the Svenska Dagbladet. But what amazes me more from uh, Oscar's her capacity to relate all those topics to real life subjects and to not mince her words when it comes to dealing with the relationship between economics and politics. So without further ado, Oscar, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yo podía hablar español en el pasado, pero lo olvidé todo cuando empecé a aprender sueco. So next time I'm here, I'll try to uh, present in Spanish. I'm all ever more motivated to get my Spanish back. Um, thank you so much, um, uh, Kanya de Blanc uh, Foundation, for allowing me to be a part of a fascinating event as such, and the University of uh, Valencia for hosting us, of course. Uh, this, is, um, uh, this is a topic that is somewhat difficult to talk about, depending on where you are, who you, who you talk to, of course. There are certain uh, ends of it uh, that are a little loose. Uh, and we all uh, are trying to contribute to uh, this debate that is uh, quite central to the public debate in almost every country um, in and around Europe. Uh, and I, together with a number of colleagues, uh, both in the UK and in Sweden, we try to do this from a spatial angle. So what we are specialized in is geographical economics. We are interested in identifying the spatial, the geographical context in which people behave in the way they do. And of course, manifesting your political preferences is uh, obviously uh, and quite strongly tied to where, where you are and where you come from and how mobile you are, both within a country and across different countries. Uh, so, um, uh, although the central theme is going to be some work um, uh, on, on Brexit, I also would like to show you some more recent work that we have done using some Swedish data, too. Um, some of what I will say during the presentation may sound like I am challenging my, my, uh, my colleagues. Uh, that is not the intention. On the contrary, I think they are, um, so what we find uh, is, is rather complementary to the extent that uh, I have been a little uneasy with the way we define who revenge voter is, right, in, 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 all, of, in all of these countries. Um, and I'll get to that and I'll try to explain you, or rather I'll, I will try to convince you why it's, it's very important that we are not rushing into um, building a, a rather stereotype around who, who the revenge voter is. And I will try to link this to geographies of discontent, uh, or, or in other words, the left behind places and their revenge. Um, this is often discussed in the context of north-south divide, uh, east-west divide, rural-urban divide, metropolitan small city divide, core periphery divide, um, and I'll try to challenge that front also a little bit. So what do we know? Um, already in 2018, uh, when Andres Rodriguez Pose sort of provided, I would say, us with the framework within which we could operate in at least urban and regional studies, uh, we had the inclination uh, to believe uh, 
from our you know, preliminary analysis, from our explorative, explorative uh, studies, that there was a very strong correlation between how places performed and how people uh, manifested their political preference in uh, a, a number of countries in Europe, but also at different spatial scales. And by spatial scales, I mean these kinds of correlations hold when we look at the neighborhood level, when we look at the city level, when we look at the regional level, and even at the country level, right? That this kind of persistence across different geographical uh, scales is something that is quite fascinating, and you don't come across these things quite often. Uh, so some outcome variables, such as support for populism on the left-hand side, we try to explain this by some right-hand side variable, let's say how well uh, an area is performing, you often have an idea uh, how that performance should be measured, and you have an idea around what geographical scale you would like to measure that kind of performance. Either you are interested in how the city municipality is performing, how the region is performing, uh, but, but this kind of correlation, very strong correlation between the way places perform and the way people vote seem to be very persistent across different geographical uh, levels also. Uh, so uh, when Andres uh, published, uh, Andres Rodriguez Poza published the paper, The Revenge of the Left Behind Places, it of course sort of initiated this, uh, this uh, storm of interest uh, among many of us and we tried to see whether such relationship holds in different countries, in different geographical scales, uh, what kind of uh, variables we shall consider, how we can sort of uh, use our tools in our toolbox, depending on whichever uh, sort of field within the social sciences we come from to explain the spatial context in which we, we observe this kind of political discontent or the manifestation of political discontent, right? Uh, some of the things are already mentioned by both Andres and, and Jonathan, so apologies for being a little repetitive, but perhaps we shall be repetitive so that we internalize some of these dynamics. Um, and that they are not stigmatized anymore so that we can talk freely about it wherever we are. Uh, the obvious thing that uh, comes to mind is, uh, is a topic that is uh, covered in development economics literature quite a lot and that is proximity to the uh, nation's capital. In a number of papers in development economics already, uh, many, many uh, economists explored how, for example, the efficacy of an institutional design can uh, be capitalized on by other parts of the country, depending on the sort of nearness, the proximity uh, to the capital. And in a similar context, uh, in, in a very similar context, uh, we see that the distance from any given location to the nation's capital is also a driver of discontent. So that it, it really does matter how close you are to the sort of the central uh, decision-making uh, mechanisms. Uh, in another way, uh, public services or access to public services is, is pointed uh, out to be important drivers of the manifestation of political discontent, weakening of, of access to pu public services in an, um, uh, in an uneven fashion across different parts of a country is uh, often discussed in this line of literature as, as an important driver. Uh, of uh, political discontent and how it is manifested. So it's not only the absolute access, but how your access has improved or, or regressed over time relative to the average of the country, right? So that on, uh, on average, if you take, for example, a region in the UK and uh, examine its access to public services, depending on which country you are using as a benchmark, things may look rather good. Right? But that's sort of the related, uh, so the relative versus the absolute kind of argument that how things changed uh, and how fast they changed uh, over time in relation to the country's average has been an important uh, element in the manifestation of political discontent. Another uh, very popular, obviously, uh, hypothesis is around the internationalization of foreign direct investment, how much an area is exposed to globalization. Uh, again, this has been brought up uh, in the previous uh, talks. Uh, this part is a bit ambiguous, depending on, I must say, depending on which geographical scale you are interested in. For example, two Swedish uh, colleagues of mine, uh, Anders Scharne and Andreas Berry, did this kind of study looking at the relationship between support for populism and uh, globalization at the country level, and they find no uh, statistically significant, no meaningful relationship between the two at the country level. But the moment you start actually observing how this kind of effects are 
uh, experienced at uh, the sort of subnational uh, level, at the regional level, we see some uh, strong correlation again between uh, exposure to uh, globalization and uh, preferences uh, for uh, populist, populist parties and populist political sentiments. Dorling and uh, Thomson talk uh, a bit about the austerity policies and how austerity policies also had some regional uh, inequality element to it that uh, not every place uh, was exposed to austerity policies in the same fashion, that there was some variation in that uh, also, which could be linked to this manifestation of, of political discontent was another idea that was explored uh, in the literature. And finally, the obvious uh, thing that kept me up all night yesterday, actually, um, it's this anti-immigration uh, sentiments and how both uh, the absolute migration and relative migration and the speed of migration is perceived by people in different areas and how that actually may contribute to uh, some of the cultural uh, backlash uh, that, that we observe and the cultural grievances we observe. Uh, we did find uh, in a sort of a policy brief together with a, a colleague of Mayo and Wenstrom, uh, sort of this uneven distribution of refugees following Second Iraq War uh, in 2006 onwards in Sweden across different Swedish municipalities was very tightly linked, albeit not in a causal fashion, but in a, a sort of a, a, a relational, uh, f a sort of a descriptive uh, fashion, how it was uh, highly linked to the rise of um, support for the Sweden, uh, for, for, for Sweden Democrats in, in, in Sweden. Um, and the reason why this kept me up all night, just, uh, just, just to mention, um, uh, Andres uh, already mentioned that I am uh, from Turkey originally, but I spent almost all my adult life in Sweden. So I'm a double citizen uh, of Turkey and Sweden, and my position about migration did not change much over the past 10, 15 years. Uh, so I, I try to approach this from a rather analytical point of view, try to be pragmatic and, 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 and examine what it means for different places and different people. Uh, but depending on the country context, you may be understood in a completely different fashion, of course. So now, for example, in Turkey, uh, things are really heated up. Uh, the, speaking of polarization, two pol uh, the, the whole uh, public debate is split into, uh, to, into two uh, distinctly different camps, and there is no room for any uh, sort of center uh, position, uh, which is very worrying. Uh, so we await some nakomud, um, uh, some pogroms. Um, uh, we, we, we would like to think that there's a likelihood of observing things that are not, uh, that, that are not desirable uh, in, in the near future. But the anti-immigration sentiments is discussed a lot uh, as, as a driving force for uh, sort of these cultural grievances in the literature. And then we talk about all of these elements associated with um, uh, how uh, you know, different kind of spatial contexts may um, deliver different kind of political preferences, and comes the waters. So that it's not the places that vote, but the pe people that live in them. Uh, I just picked a paper at random, but you can find many, 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 many papers as such, um, mostly uh, written by political economists, with the good intention to describe who uh, a, a voter is, any voter is, basically, right? That we would like to understand the probability of an individual uh, voting in a certain way with respect to his or her individual characteristics. There are certain uh, statistical tools available to us. As long as there's data that is available, we can more or less describe what the typical voter uh, is. This is uh, true for every country, as it was the case for Brexit. Andres uh, mentioned a, sort, a number of aspects that are highly correlated with who the Brexit voter was. You know, the white old man, low education attainment, limited engagement with new technology, often conservative, living in, in a certain type of place and so on, so that you can describe the, the average uh, Brexit voter. Um, where does he, she live? Um, in places with strong economic grievances, low income areas, low education attainment, high out migration, high unemployment, high public fund cuts, low quality of infrastructure uh, in peripheral rural areas, uh, high exposure to globalization, quite limited ability to adapt to structural changes, uh, both in terms of uh, lim limitations with human capital, but also in terms of uh, the, the economic structure of the areas that they live in. 
And then the question becomes, so if we take all of these people that are described by, by this formula and add, add, the num, uh, add them up, uh, does it add up? Do we actually uh, have as many people as it would be required for a vote to happen in a certain way, right? Uh, this is the absolute versus relative part that, that I am extremely interested in because we had the same narrative in Sweden too, who votes for Sweden Democrats, so that there's a description of the standard voters. And then when we add them up, um, the number is not as high as the total support that Sweden Democrats get. If you add the number of people up that are described by uh, the sort of this template uh, that is built in part in literature and in part in public debate for, what, uh, for who a Brexit voter is, if you add, the to add, add them up, the total number is way, way lower than 50% of the population. Uh, so we are missing something, obviously, that there are people and a, a quite significant share of the population that do not fit in this, in this formula uh, that also manifested their discontent in a, in a particular way. Um, and together with my colleague, uh, Maria Abra uh, at the Department of Land Economy at the University of Cambridge, again, and we use this kind of sort of empirical strategy in, in other contexts, explaining other things too, but this time we wanted to distangle the Brexit vote uh, with, a, with a particular focus on the role of economic, social, and cultural contexts uh, in, the, in the UK. And what to consider here is that why we are missing all these people that do not fit in, in, uh, in uh, the, the template we have for what uh, the average voter is, is the strong correlation between the individual and the spatial or regional characteristics, right? People are not randomly sorted in space, uh, so where we end up living is highly correlated with the kind of people we are, both in terms of our observable skills, our worldview and opinions, um, uh, our values and virtues or uh, the absence of virtues, however you'd like to think about these things, we are not randomly spread, uh, spread uh, across the country. That, that there's a very strong correlation between who we are and where we live. At the country level, at the regional level, again at the city level, but more so even at the constituency level, right? That, uh, that we would like to uh, be surrounded by people that are like us. Um, either that are equally educated or uh, have the same type of uh, history as us, so that this identification through space is a very strong uh, and very persistent pattern we observe in all countries across time, right? Uh, and this kind of correlation makes it very difficult for us to identify what part of the support we observe for populist parties comes from these individual characteristics, right? Uh, uh, in other words, how much of it we can um, assign to the people themselves and how much of it we can relate to left behind uh, places, so the economic grievances in lagging, in lagging areas. And it's, an important, it's a very important thing to do if we are to design policies to mitigate this kind of uh, pattern, this kind of development, right? That we want to understand what we are able to uh, change by way of um, immediate, medium or long-term uh, policy design. And, and depending on the importance we identify associated with space versus people, um, uh, we would end up designing completely different types of policies, obviously. So um, essentially what we try to do is to look at the neighborhood effects and the neighborhood selection. Uh, meaning uh, if I were to create a pool of people that were seemingly identical and, assign, and I assign them at random to all sorts of places, how would they behave then, right? If, if there was OSGE 1, OSGE 2, OSGE 3, OSGE 4, OSGE 5, and so on, and I randomly assign them to different kind of environments, some of them performing better than others, that would be an interesting quasi-experimental design, which is not possible to do in real life, since we're dealing with actual people and, and political sentiments. But could we come up with a, a sort of a clever way of uh, building an empirical design that can allow us to do this kind of thing? Because then we could look into what we call neighborhood effects. What truly comes from being surrounded by uh, a particular type of peers and living in a particular type of place, right? 
then we can identify the importance of, of spatial characteristics. The geography, importance of geography can then be isolated away. So just moving away from the typical sort of the description of the voter, but trying to understand what living in an area does requires us to sort of isolate away all of these selection, selection issues. And there are a number of neighborhood effects uh, that are discussed in this very broad, very big body of literature, mostly from political science, but more recently, um, political geography is making significant contributions on that front. I will list five of them that I uh, would like to think, or that we, we would like to think are, are more prominent. The obvious one is the social interaction. This picture, I like this picture. I'm using it in every presentation I have these days. Uh, actually, Andres saw me present a, a, a uh, my, my work on ethnic enclaves, and this is a very good picture to use in that context too, because this is from 1969, London, the skinheads and the hippies sharing the same space. Uh, this is sort of the idea that we would like to be surrounded by people that are like us, uh, but we don't want to be completely separated away from the people that are not like us. We still want to be sufficiently close to people that are different than us, so that there's this optimal level of diversity that can apply to uh, cultural diversity, ethnic diversity, that can apply to, of course, political diversity, right? That you, you, you want to feel uh, like you belong, so you need a sufficient number of people that are like you, but you don't want to be completely isolated away from the other people either. So that it's a very, it's a very, fine, it's a very fine balance. Um, so among these neighborhood effects, the first one is obviously social interaction. What do we mean by social interaction? Individuals exchange views and are influenced by others within their local social networks. That we all know. Another way uh, living in a particular neighborhood may affect our political preference is by neighborhood selection. And this is the part that we are trying to tackle, right? Uh, that uh, individuals move to neighborhoods composed of others with similar characteristics and views. Uh, so, uh, if I don't control for this, if we are not cautious about this, we may confuse what comes from, in, what comes from individual characteristics and what comes from neighborhood with one another, right? Maybe we are just observing people optimizing their location and it has nothing to do with living in a particular place. It, it so happens that similar people ends up in similar kinds of environments so that it has nothing to do with the place, maybe. So this is something to be, uh, to be tackled. A uh, third mechanism that is discussed quite a bit is emulation. This is individuals conforming to local social norms and choose to behave like others in the neighborhood, even in the absence of social interaction. This is observation and mimicking, right? That, that you be, and we talked a lot about this yesterday in relation to Brexit, that sometimes some of the sentiments around uh, cultural uh, grievances that we observed uh, in, in Brexit vote I don't necessarily believe that people believed in them when they manifested it, but that they converged to behaving in a certain fashion because of being in, in, in a certain social context, either in their neighborhood or in their occupational cluster, like the fishing community and so on, that, that it was mimicking uh, through emulation, almost. I'm, this is, I'm, I'm speculating, obviously. I have no numbers for it, but it seems rather reasonable, right? A fourth mechanism that we can talk about is the environmental observation again, uh, that individuals may identify local issues, things that matter more to us in our own local uh, area, and vote for parties that will act in the interests of their local neighborhood, right? Um, this is something uh, I'll show you in a second. We observe, for example, in Sweden to be the case a little bit. Mm -hmm. Uh, that your preferences for uh, the national uh, political power may differ dramatically than what you want for your local area is the kind of idea here. If you believe that a certain political movement can benefit you more by addressing exactly what's pro what you find to be problematic in your local area, right? So this also is linked to what kind of political efforts, what kind of campaigning efforts you may observe in different kinds of environments by different, by different political parties. And finally, the political mobilization, that political parties can campaign more in relation to this intensively in certain areas, and electoral outcomes therefore may differ by location. This is the friends and neighbors voting type of idea, that if you actually want to gain support in a particular area, you will try to target the things that they find more interesting or that they are more concerned about. This is, uh, this is the political mobilization mechanism. I'm not, thankfully, going to spend uh, too much time on the cultural grievances, as Jonathan did an amazing job 
uh, on it, as far as my Spanish allowed me to understand that. <laughs> but the cultural backlash is, is, is uh, in this context, is extremely important, of course, because it is, uh, as Johnson talked about it, uh, and, and explored by Norris and Inglard, um, that uh, this perceived expansion of social liberal values in society is discussed to uh, stimulate these cultural, uh, this kind of cultural backlash we observe uh, at an increasing rate in, in all sorts of places. Uh, in part, this is related to a cultural majority becoming a cultural minority or having a sentiment uh, or feeling that that's the case. Uh, sometimes that may not necessarily be real either, that you may feel like you are becoming a cultural minority, right? Uh, sometimes because some minorities have uh, a lot of voice in public space or in social media that, uh, that your idea of what, what a minority is and what a majority is may be, uh, may be mixed up by your uh, observation of, of what was being presented in front of you. And the idea was also that intergenerational population replacement of the baby boomers uh, by younger generation is, is a part of it. Uh, we can talk a little bit more about the sort of uh, younger generation having more social liberal views and older generation having more conservative views, a um, uh, bit that Jonathan mentioned, but we know that as people uh, grow old, they become more conservative uh, over time across uh, time in all countries, so this is a very persistent pattern we observe, so it's a temporal observation in my opinion and we shouldn't make too much of it, but that's, again, uh, that's a view uh, rather than a fact. And uh, a part of the cultural grievances, once again, is related to migration. Sometimes it's not uh, at all about the absolute migration, so when you look at the areas where people have anti-immigration sentiment, these areas are found not necessarily to be the areas that receive the highest amount of uh, migrants over a particular period of time, or that have the highest uh, migrant share compared to other places within the same country. Uh, but uh, that the uh, perception of uh, immigration is, is higher, or sometimes uh, they find, uh, as it is the case with some of our preliminary findings for, uh, for the Swedish uh, elections, that it's the, uh, it's the uh, growth rate of immigration. So it's the, uh, the speed of change rather than the change itself that people react to in these areas, uh, and this sort of feeds into the cultural grievances uh, we observe. So what we did to tackle all of these things to understand why we observe uh, this kind of support uh, we did, why we observe the kind of support we did for Brexit. And this is, as long as you have a similar type of data at the individual level, this is kind of cool because this can be applied to any country context, right? Whoever wants to differentiate between individual characteristics and geographical context, can actually replicate this kind of empirical analysis without any problem, that there's nothing special necessarily with the, kind of, uh, with the kind of data we use. This is individual level data from British election study. Uh, this is a very uh, nationally representative survey on political views and electoral uh, behavior. The, um, uh, we use the uh, wave that is um, the immediate wave uh, post-referendum uh, wave of the survey. Uh, we work with a total of roughly 18,000 uh, or 17,500 uh, or so observations for a total of 632 constituencies in the, in the UK, uh, excluding the Northern uh, Ireland due to some comparability issues. And um, the average size of the electorate per constituency varies somewhere between 50,000 and 75,000. And... Um, uh, what we do, I'm not going to go so much into detail with the technical bit, but what we do is uh, exactly what I described earlier, that we are trying to match all of these individuals with one another as if they are uh, identical in their observables, right? What if these people were all extremely well comparable with one another? So if I corrected for the differences in their individual characteristics, and made a pool of people that were seemingly identical in their individual characteristics, and I, and I assigned them at random to different constituencies, how would they vote, right? Uh, that's, what, that's, what we, that's what we try to do. 
um, so that we can s uh, isolate the effect of political mobilization from environmental observation, uh, such as social interaction and economic grievances, uh, from cultural grievances. So we want to know what matters more, right? Among all of these mechanisms that we discussed to be quite relevant to a Brexit vote, uh, what matters more? We want, to, we want to identify, so we want a horse race. Uh, it's, they're not mutually exclusive, all of them operate at the same time, but we want to horse race these different mechanisms to identify what matters more. Uh, and the kind of treatment uh, that we have, or rather uh, the way we differentiate between different areas is to see whether an area is above or below in any of these aspects, right? Um, creating comparable peers uh, is very important, so you may be wondering how on earth you can have thousands of individuals that are all so different in their individual attributes and treat them as if they are the same people. So these uh, new matching methods that we have uh, allow us to make them look similar in our analysis on a number of aspects they have, such as their age, education, ethnicity, their employment status, household income, and the nice thing about the UK data that is not available in other countries often is their personality traits. In this case, we use openness and conscientiousness. Uh, we try different types of uh, personality traits in, in big five personality types also, because that's the, that's the kind of thing that you want to know also, right? That you want to normalize all of the individuals across these dimensions. Uh, things like political efficacy and the kind of newspapers they read which is also quite important, right, that where you get your news from, so that we are creating this pool of very comparable people, so that we are not comparing apples and oranges, which is what I thought about yesterday also. In every language, it, there are two fruits that are used to describe this kind of thing. What is it in Spanish, I wonder? Is, it, is there one? We say apples and pears in Turkish, and it's apples and oranges in English. And is, it, is there something? Yeah. So what do we find? Let's look at the contextual relevance, meaning um, how the area level where you live affects the way you vote. Um, we find that living in a leave voting area increases the individual likelihood of voting leave by 8.3 percentage points, as does living in a strong UKIP area. That's by seven points uh, higher propensity. And living in a low turnout area, that's uh, three, three points higher propensity to vote, even controlling for all of these individual determinants, right? That looking at seemingly identical people. So for all of these uh, variables, our composition effect is rather relatively small, meaning that the contextual effects linked to political emulation, things like political views, likelihood of voting, are very important drivers of, uh, of the vote, of the way people voted uh, at the local level. In particular, if we are to look into the economic grievances, this is the part that, uh, that uh, is accentuated in the literature possibly most, you know, the decline that you experience or uh, you observe uh, to be the case around you. Uh, what do we see? Well, the kind of economic variables we use are low wage growth, inactivity rates, welfare claimants, uh, things that can be used to proxy for austerity, and inequality, of course, in the local area, which is a very important thing, as, as Jonathan mentioned. And what we find that these do not matter as much as we would like to think if we are to, again, compare extremely comparable individuals with one another. Uh, meaning the economic variable, the only economic variable that is actually statistically significant was the low wage growth. And this li links to the inequality or the changes in, in changes in inequality a bit. Uh, I, uh, cannot agree more how important that, that part is, that it's not necessarily the absolute level of uh, economic performance, but the way things diverge uh, from one another across different locations, uh, I guess, contributes to these economic grievances more. And cultural uh, grievances. Uh, the first thing you would like to see uh, is how people behave in different areas with different levels of migration, and we find no statistically significant effect actually on the leave vote for individuals living in high immigration areas. Again, when we compare uh, very comparable individuals, right? If I had two Ozges in two different locations, one in a high immigration area and one in a low immigration area, would I vote different just because of the immigration level itself? It doesn't seem to be the. It doesn't seem to be the case uh, in the Brexit context. But uh, I shall note this again uh, 
Uh, we here in the study find no effects uh, from the level of immigration uh, and we find no effects from the growth of immigration. Uh, but there are studies actually that show that it may not necessarily be the level of uh, immigration, but it's the speed of change in the demographic composition around you. So that that may put you at uh, an uneasy uh, state of mind with regards to your cultural uh, grievances or how you perceive the cultural shift to happen around you. Uh, and other treatments covering cultural grievances are all similarly highly statistically significant actually. These are things like uh, the pro uh, living in a, a high-skilled area, views on anti-same um, sex marriage, uh, pro-redistribution uh, views and so on. So things that are more sentimental, more of, of uh, value and, and cultural type seem to matter quite a lot so that we find most of the effect in the, in the cultural variables, not in the economic variables necessarily. So controlling for composition, again, um, in our sort of uh, humble attempts to horse race these different attributes, we find that culture matters more. Um, I would like to wrap up by showing a couple of things that I believe are important to talk about in this context, because here uh, in, in the Brexit in the Brexit study, we tried to, again, decompose the support for, for populism into individual elements, the, into the voter and where the voter lives. Uh, but also the other aspect that uh, we've been discussing about is how the proximity to uh, the central power is discussed in the literature, that there exists a capital and, and then there are places at the periphery. There are urban places and there are places that are rural, there are places that are central, there are places that are peripheral. In most of the countries, we see these north-south divide. Andres' uh, maps on uh, support for populism across different European regions was very uh, striking, particularly for places like Portugal, for example. You can almost draw a line in, in the middle of the country, right, uh, looking at the stark difference between, between the uh, different places. So all of that is right, right? That we see some dichotomy between different types of places. Uh, if we were to uh, sort of construct these dualities between, uh, between places. But what we wanted to do uh, is to complement this kind of analysis with a, a relational approach. Um, may his soul rest in peace, Waldo Tobler, uh, who passed away a few years back, is the, sort of a, a very big name in, in modern geography, said once, sort of following this Newtonian gravitational idea that everything is related to everything else, but near things are more related than distant things. And this kind of relational um, approach is very important, particularly for capturing uh, the importance of inequalities that Jonathan very elegantly uh, explained in the, in the previous uh, presentation, right? So how I perceive my region, my area, my city or neighborhood is, is, is doing is going to be extremely dependent on how all the other places around me perform, right? I don't necessarily sit in a neighborhood in a city and pick some uh, major city uh, that may be far, far from me and, and use that as a benchmark to see how well my area is doing. You think about the commuting patterns, right? People commute between cities, between areas that are very close to each other. These places are very well integrated in regional systems, particularly in Europe. So you are exposed to places that are near you way more than places that are far away. So on, on average, you may be performing rather well, but you may be performing dramatically worse than all the areas around you. And that may very well uh, contribute to the way you manifest your, your political discontent. Not necessarily the absolute disadvantage uh, that is associated with the economic performance in your region, but how much you are lagging behind compared to the other places in your own regional network. So together with two uh, more Cambridge colleagues, Johan P. Larsson and Francesca Silke, we did the study for Sweden where we used an accessibility framework. So we considered all of the places to be related to all other places, but we discounted their relevance by distance to them. Um, again, I'm not going to go into detail so much uh, in terms of the technicalities around it. 
uh, but this is accounting for uh, not only the proximity to Stockholm, uh, which is probably the only place that you would consider to be a metropolitan area, uh, truly in, in, in Sweden, but also looking at sort of the proximity to other places in your own regional network. And what we find is that uh, the increase in, in support for Sweden Democrats between the 2014 and 2018 elections, um, a higher uh, accessibility or that, that the higher accessibility to other very large municipalities within your region, uh, as well uh, as being surrounded by relatively larger neighboring regions, uh, is associated with further support with ESTE, even when we control for your overall economic performance. So here we are doing a similar thing, comparing places that are very comparable in how they are in absolute terms. You know, there's Valencia 1 and Valencia 2. So I have exactly uh, two very comparable places. One of them is surrounded by um, a number of places that are performing way better uh, than the others. Uh, and all of a sudden we see a, a higher, uh, more stronger manifestation of political discontent again. Uh, this brings us to the importance of, of course, uh, uh, regional integration, uh, how we can capitalize on it to mitigate some of the, some of the uh, issues that we observe. So it's not only about the transfers from the capital to the rest of the country, but, but how you can equalize uh, conditions within, within regions, right? And to me, um, not that I have a solution to this problem, but this is a, a relatively easier problem to fix. Uh, and yes, uh, geo-loyalty matters also is what we find. Sorting matters, um, interaction between individual and spatial characteristics are extremely overlooked in the literature. We have to be extremely cautious when we are describing what a typical voter is. Um, absolute versus relative support matters. Uh, this is to say that characterizing the typical voter or the typical area is not sufficient because they don't add up to the total support often we observe in, in these countries. Regional hierarchies matter. We can't think of these, these spaces in isolation. We have to understand the regional context in which they operate. And uh, local political efforts may actually pay off even when they don't. Uh, and we can discuss more about this during the roundtable discussion, but the localized political efforts are, or they seem to be very important uh, for uh, combating populism uh, or populist trends. Thank you uh, very much. Thank you very much, uh, Oske, for an amazing presentation. Uh, we are somewhat running out of time, and we're going to have to introduce Rune in a moment. But before we go, I, wouldn't, I would like to, I mean, you've raised quite a lot of issues in your presentation. If there's one or two questions maximum from the audience, Yes, please go ahead. This is the part where I'm supposed to speak Spanish. <laughs> thank you very much. I thank you. Uh, it has been a great presentation and a great communication too. Um, my question is about Sweden. Um, my husband's Swedish, so I, I go every year. Half, half of my family lives there. And I wanted to ask you about, um, when I go there and ask the people, um, immigration has been there for a very long time. I mean, since Chile, you know, Pinochet, I mean, this, a lot of people, second generation, born there with, from many countries. Uh, and now, uh, I think uh, people are not, are not, feel not safe. Uh, is it, does it have to do this um, more extreme voting towards these parties that uh, are against immigration has to do with the increasement of crime in the country and that, you know, neighborhoods in Göteborg, uh, Stockholm are getting more and more unsafe. In my case, when I talk to older people, they tell me, we feel unsafe, it has never been the same in Sweden before. So, you know, they tend to move to the extreme just because of that. It's not the immigration itself, it's more the, the impact of immigration in, in, in the country. Uh, just if you hold it for a second, we'll accumulate another question if there's another one. Anyone else wants to ask a question? All right, so that's it. Please so go ahead. I, thank you so much for asking that. Uh, I'd like to talk about that five hours nonstop, basically, yeah. because I've spent the past roughly six years doing nothing but working on ethnic enclaves in Sweden and asking these kinds of questions, writing about them in, in my columns, 
uh, I am uh, almost fixated with, I mean, I'm, I'm really obsessed with, with what has happened in Sweden because when I moved to Sweden in, in the early 2000s, it was a different country back then. Uh, even I, as an immigrant, uh, from first hand, exper I, I've experienced how the social fabric has changed. And it's a very difficult thing to talk about, uh, right? Because you're talking about visible minorities and always there's this slippery slope kind of situation that you need to be very, very, very careful when you're talking about these things. But one thing that you point out is very interesting. When you look at Eurobarometer, so the statistics that is collected by Brussels, um, the biggest gap between the EU average, when you look at all of the member states, um, and compare it against any country on a number of issues from you know, climate to security to healthcare, whatnot. The largest gap, uh, Sweden has the largest gap between the uh, average sentiment for safety and what is considered to be sort of the situation in Sweden. Uh, Swedes do not feel safe. And that has a lot to do with the formation of what we call Utenforskaps, uh, so the vulnerable areas outside of, outside of the cities. Uh, the other part is again uh, sort of related to what I mentioned. It's not necessarily the absolute migration, but how, how rapidly, how rapidly things changed. It changed so fast, um, and, and you hope that cultural evolution ha happens in an evolutionary, uh, in, an, in an evolutionary way, that people are not forced to adapt to different living circumstances in, in a short period of time, because that's always destabilizing at any geographical level, basically. So, so that's, that's, that's a part of the story. It's a little different than the Chilean migration or even the Balkan migration that happened in the early 90s, because when you look at, for example, Balkan migration, you have like one, and a two, one or two years period where a lot of people arrive and then you uh, go back to the initial uh, levels of migration. But when you look at the Middle Eastern uh, migration to Sweden, it starts in 2006, it, uh, between 2005 and 2006, following the Second Iraq War. It dips uh, a little bit right after, but then it picks up again, and it's ever-growing ever since, uh, right? So that there is this unease about, uh, unease about demographic transition and the speed of it, and that should be separated from... Uh, general sentiments towards visible minorities. I think it's, it's very important to discuss these two things in, 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 in a different fashion. But I'd like to talk more about that because... Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Okay, so thank you very much. I think. Thank you. Thank you.